trying to reconnect. Okay. I'm gonna move that too. <laughs> Tell me when it's reconnected. You're good. Awesome. All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our March Learning Breakfast. We've really got a treat for you today. Our guest today is uh, Stephen Kaufman, CEO of Zeus Mortgage Bank, and he is going to give you kind of the 411 on hard money lending, crowdfunding, any other trends that are happening with that, and then we will give you a chance to have an all-access AMA with him. So get your questions ready, uh, post those in the comments, comment, let us know you're here, um, and we'll get them answered. And without any further ado, let me introduce you to Stephen Kaufman. All right, great, 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 great. Okay, so um, um, this is my first Facebook Live experience ever, because whenever I see it on Facebook, I turn it off immediately. Uh, <laughs> um, um, because like all the other people who are doing Facebook Live, I always like the people who should have Facebook Live don't, and the people who do have it should like have to earn into it or something. Um, so I, I hope I'm the former group and not the latter. But um, okay, so we're talking about hard money, crowdfunding. I want to first tell you that we're going to use abbreviations or synonyms that you want to be aware of. The first is that for hard money, bridge lending, temp to perm, rehab, um, non-traditional lending, alternative lending, all mean the same thing as hard money lending. So I'll say that one more time. Bridge lending, temp to perm lending, rehab lending, non-traditional lending, all mean the same. They've been, they've been used, even including transactional funding and gap funding, have all been used as synonyms of hard money. And what is hard money? So the easiest way to explain it is if you take uh, a bank which is traditional lending, like Zeus Mortgage Bank, we do traditional lending, or Bank of America, we'll start with traditional loans. Then if you think about your community bank, where you go and you get a little bit higher interest rates, uh, a little bit tougher, or a little bit easier terms, but a little bit higher interest rate, but the loans for, for a less period of time. Traditional mortgage is 30 years, your bank's maybe gonna give you seven to 10 years. Hard money or non-traditional lending is gonna give you something around six months two, three to five years. So it's a shorter period of time. It's easier to get, but the cost is a little bit higher. Now, let's talk about crowdfunding. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is a buzzword. It's, uh, it's a buzzword for the next evolution, what we call the next evolution of hard money. It's the same exact thing, except where's the money coming from? The money on hard money is coming from a bank or an institution or an individual lender, but on crowdfunding, the money is actually coming from the crowd. For example, on ZeusCrowdfunding.com, right now we have lists of investments and those have been funded by individuals who are fully or fractionally participating in each investment that we've made. We make an investment, we give a hard money loan, and then individuals come, the crowd comes, and they participate. No different than GoFundMe or Kickstarter or anything else. The difference with real estate crowdfunding sites like ours is that we have to pre-fund the transaction because if we don't, the contract will expire. So everyone who's watching is probably a real estate investor, so they know that you get something under contract. You have a short, certain amount of time to perform. If you don't perform, you risk losing your transaction. Well, we subsidize that process by pre-funding the transaction and let, then letting the crowd come in afterwards. I'll take a breath now. <laughs> <laughs> I got through the hardest part. Um, so I'm, I'm ready for questions online or from you guys. Um, in, in absence of any questions, I want to tell you why someone would want to get crowdfunding or hard money. Because it's the most common question. Most people presume that getting hard money or crowdfunding is only for people who have bad credit. And that could not be further from the truth. In fact, the reality is uh, for um, uh, crowdfunding or hard money is that there are four reasons why. Uh, and let me, let me tell you what they are. The four reasons why someone would ever want hard money or crowdfunding. Ready? Number one, and most importantly, is speed. Because if you're on myhousedeals.com, for example, and you find a property and they are, the, the seller of that property is going to get two offers, one offer is going to close in 30 days and one of them is going to close in three days, and it's a distressed seller, which offer do you think the seller is going to take? A 30-day offer, so the, person will, the buyer will close in 30 days, or the buyer will close in three days? Three days. Three days. Thank you for not thinking that was rhetorical. <laughs> uh, 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 yes, they will take the offer to close in three days. So... When a, a traditional mortgage is going to take about 45 days, so if you go to Bank of America, Wells Fargo, it's going to take on average 30 to 45 days. A bank's going to take about three to four weeks, but with crowdfunding or hard money, you can get a transaction done in four days and not four weeks. That's the big difference. That's the number one reason why people come to get non-traditional lending, like hard money or crowdfunding. The second reason would be that if they want to conserve some of their capital. So um, can, can, uh, can this be seen? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, like, yeah. 
So if you were going to uh, Wells Fargo Bank and you were buying a, a um, and actually can someone queue up their uh, their iPhone calc or something? Uh, I'll need an I'll need a calculator. Got it. It would be easy. Thank you. If someone's buying a, a sixty thousand uh, dollar property, this is the purchase price, right? And they need a twenty five thousand dollars worth of repairs. And let's say that their closing costs to third parties, taxes, title, lender, everything else, uh, they're going to need ninety thousand dollars to to do this deal. This is how much they need. On a traditional loan, you're going to need 20 to 25% of this. So what's 25% as a down payment? $22,000. I'm, I'm sorry, Paul. I apologize. 25% of 60000 $15,000. They'll need to put 25% down of that sixty to get the loan. And how much was that? Uh, of the $15,000. 15, so 15 k is a down payment plus the 25000 in repairs. Plus the five closing costs, they're going to be out of pocket. What is that, 55 uh, or 45? 45. So they're going to be out of pocket $45,000 if they go through Wells Fargo. Now, if they go through, for example, shameless plug to Zeus Crowdfunding, uh, same transaction, 60K, 25K, and 5K, same numbers, right? They need 90,000. The thing that's unique about hard money or crowdfunding is that you can actually make this loan on what the property will be worth, not what it's being sold for today. So this property, let's say, for example, will be worth, after it's fixed up, it'll be worth 165 k sometimes referred to as the ARV, the after repaired value. Uh, let's assume they're getting 75% of the ARV. Paul, can you give me that? 123700 They can actually borrow $123,000 and change but they only need $90,000. So the coolest thing about this scenario is that this borrower can finance it with actually zero money out of their pocket. There's actually a surplus. Now, some of you might write in and want to know, do they get that extra $33,000? The answer is no, they don't. They don't get to walk away with the money there. There are scenarios when you take this loan and convert it to Wells Fargo, you can walk away with any, some cash. But in this scenario, they would buy this property for $60,000, get the rehab for $25,000, and the closing costs all rolled into a $90,000 loan. So if you're an investor who wants to conserve capital, yes, you'll pay a little bit more for this, but you'll have no money invested out of your pocket versus $45,000 over here if you went the traditional route. So investors who are really concerned about keeping more cash in their pocket or they're just starting out and they'd rather find a better deal versus going to a big bank and having more of comfort, they're willing to pay a little bit more uh, to get some flexibility than having to bring $45,000. If you have $100,000 in total to invest, that means you can only do two deals on this model. This is the traditional model. M smart investors, smart money, usually invest this way. Um, that was the second reason. So the first reason I told you was speed. The second reason I told you was conservation of capital. The third reason is gonna be that you have a non-traditional borrower. They have the cash, but they don't have the traditional income that Wells Fargo is gonna want or need. And so a borrower will call us because they don't, baby boomers, for example, who have retired are looking for their second job. The most common job for a baby boomer, their, their most common retirement job is real estate, whether it's being an agent or an investor. That's pretty amazing. And they cannot go down this route because they don't have a regular income to report. They, have, they go down something like this. Uh, and the, the fourth reason would be a non-traditional uh, property. The property is so ugly that even Wells Fargo won't lend on it. Uh, and since we, uh, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, we, uh, we like ugly property. Okay? Those are the four reasons. Are there reasons why you would turn down somebody? I mean, the property is just so bad, like, you, like I don't want that at all? Um, we don't lend on certain types of property. We're not alone. We don't, uh, some acronyms for you, we don't lend on SOBs. Uh, uh, I, I know you don't know, that's why I'm saying it. That was for the shock value. Uh, 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 it was a sexual, we don't lend on sexually oriented businesses. So an SOB is a sexual oriented business. We don't lend on that property type. Uh, we don't lend on POWs. They gotta hear, you're supposed to say, I don't know what that I is. I don't know what that is. Okay, perfect. It's just me and you in this, okay? Without you, I'd, I'd, I'd be sweating a lot. A POW is a place of worship. So no SOBs, no uh, POWs uh, um, as far as property type. And then there, if a property is really ugly, it's, as long as the, the, the transaction makes sense, we, we don't see, we see what's possible. We don't see what's there. Uh, another question, back 
to the investor, what's the difference to them between crowdfunding and, I guess, traditional hard money? Do they see any difference, or is it really just so that crowd can come in and get in on this real estate? Great question. Overall, the structure is the same. The advantage of crowdfunding is it's much faster and cheaper. So that's the biggest difference. So if you smart money goes to crowdfunding. I mean, if you're a smart investor and you understand the numbers, there's no reason why an investor who has used hard money or even private money in the past would not go to crowdfunding. Because again, you're, you're closing in four days and the terms are so good, as little as four days, right? That's, not, that's, an, that's like getting on the HOV link. You can get on there when you need, that's not normal. Uh, you can get on there when you need and it's possible. So any investor who's using hard money today or was, or was using hard money yesterday or private money yesterday, they're all shifting to crowdfunding. That's why it's growing so dramatically. So it'd be a cheaper interest rate? Or cheaper rate, cheaper fees, and faster. Okay. And much more transparent. Bottomless wealth. Uh, say again? Bottomless wealth. Because you have investors. You don't ever run out. Right, correct. There are a lot of issues. We, we, we do a lot of loans in our company for other companies who say they're hard money lenders, but they're not. They're borrowing the money from other people. Or they're borrowing, they don't have their own reserves. I mean, we lend money to other hard money lenders as a company. So they're, when we say cut out the middle and come, come direct to the wholesale source, we mean it. We're doing loans for other hard money lenders. So they can do their loans. We are lending them so they can make the, the loan themselves. With what Kathy just pointed out is, um, this is Kathy Villiers. She's actually our project developer for ZeusCrowdfunding.com, as a matter of fact. Um, the, the benefit is that the money's limitless. It's the world. It's the United States, for sure. But anywhere in the country... Someone can invest $5,000 in a transaction versus if you go to a, a private money lender, there is a limit on how far they can take you. Great question. Also, I heard that, the time frame of uh, one week or so, or two weeks, at least the, private, the hard money lenders I spoke to gave me at least a minimum of two weeks. Or is it because you are the source that you're able to close at a much closer, a smaller time gap? Is that why? That's a great question. I mean, you're going to see seven to ten days is pretty much the standard. A lot of companies that say that, they know they can get a couple extra days if they ever need it. Um, our, our standard is about seven days, um, and if we have to close in four days, we can and we do. We close a loan in the same day. If you can buy $100,000 Mercedes in one hour at the finance department at Mercedes-Benz, you should be able to buy a house in some amount of time if you need to. We have been able to do that in the past. We don't like to do that, but we can. Uh, four days is about the amount of time. We, we, we planted our stake years ago as a company on speed. When we, be you, uh, we became the fastest traditional mortgage lender in America, and on the crowdfunding side, no one's competing us with speed just because, again, we can close in three or four days if we need to. Partly it's because their vendors, the companies you were just asking about, their vendors aren't, aren't ready for that. It, they're not, they're, they've not been trained to go fast. That's a requirement to do business with us. You must be able to move fast uh, to, and if you're in one of our chosen markets. And secondly, um, you're right. They are probably not getting the, the funds themselves, so they're cashing out of something and they're waiting for something else to pay off before they fund your loan or they're selling this or selling that, and we, we just don't have that issue. What would be the requirements then? Let's say I've got a deal, and it's hot, but I need to close it in five days or something yeah. like that. So what would, be needed, what would need to be provided to y'all in order to close it? So the first thing you would do, if it, you came to us, we'd tell you to go to ZeusCrowdfunding.com and create a borrower profile. Now you'd create your profile, which would trigger our, our, our VP of new loans, which is Paul Obnatos, he's here. Um, he would see that email, he would reach out to you. You'll have an opportunity to upload documents to our system. It's on your time, you can upload them anytime you want, 24 seven, anywhere in the world. You upload the documents that we need and we need much less than, we need much less than a traditional bank. We need even much less than a hard money lender. We, it's a very thin file that we require for crowdfunding, very thin. It's just what's most important to make sure we can underwrite the transaction. While you're getting that together, we're ordering what's the four third, there are four third parties in every real estate transaction. We call them the ISATs. Have you heard of this before? The ISATs? Insurance, survey, appraisal, and title. You need all four of those. And all four of those vendors have to be prepared to go lightning fast. And so we, we work on that while you're working on your documentation. And you let us know your closing date. You'll ask us, can we get the transaction done that time? And knowing what our pipeline looks like, the answer almost always, I guess, is probably yes. <laughs> my issue I've always found is the title always takes forever. Depends on where the property is. We can get title open the same or next day. Given, okay, well, I guess that's a different issue. But given that property, if it's a distressed property, you usually have a lot of title issues. Right? So, so how, how, I guess, how good is your title department? Uh, so our title company is uh, very, extremely good. We also have more than one that we work with that knows that speed's important. And then if, you're, if your transaction's that hairy, that, okay, you know going in you might have some airship issues and things like that, again, that's not on us to get that done. 
right? You understand that's going to be yeah. as your seller is going to have to cooperate for that. The person selling the property, that'll actually be delayed on them. For a title company to open title, they can, in a major market, they can do it the same day or the next day. And now in a small, uh, you know, uh, suburban town, um, that could take a few more days because you're working with a county there that sees maybe one title opening every two weeks. And then that becomes more of a, more of a pressure situation on everyone's part. It's a team sport. And we, everyone pressures on the move quickly based on the time frame. Stephen, I want to take a step back and go, go back to John's question about qualifying the, the loan and the deal. So at my house seals, we have many of our members are trying to close on their first deal. What are the steps that you take them through to get them qualified? Uh, is it strictly about the property itself? What, what, for what points are you looking at as, for the individual so that they're able to get their deal funded? Great question. Can you repeat that question for people who may not hear it? Sure. I'll, Alex, I'll do my best uh, to repeat it and you, you edit what I said that might not have been spot on. Um, what's the process for an investor who is new, doing their first transaction? What do they need to have in order to get a crowdfunding loan or a hard money loan? And is it just based on the property? Is it based on them? What are the, what are the qualifications? Is basically what you asked, right? Is that about it? Yeah. Okay. So, Great question. We love first-time investors, and we, we don't just say that. Uh, uh, we back it up with pricing. In fact, we offer incentives to first-time investors because we know that if an investor's, we're doing this for the greater good of real estate investing. If your first investment is great, you will keep investing. So if you have an amazing experience on your first investment, the rest will, you're going to keep investing. It's like, uh, you understand, right? If your first investment is bad or your experience getting a loan is bad, you'll never do it again or likely that you'll never do it again. So our goal is to make sure someone has an amazing first-time investor experience. And we not only do we say that, we incentivize them pricing-wise. We actually do give first-time investors with us better pricing than someone who's been doing a lot of business with us long-term. So that's number one, our stance. Number two, from a qualification standpoint, the short answer is that it's a blend. We use an algorithm called the Z-score that we work on protect, perfecting all the time that rates a borrower and their transaction and we have a grade that we give them and the pricing that we give them is based on that grade. So do we go only on the property? No. But do we go only on the borrower? No. There is a blend and we give them a score. In general, I will tell you that um, the thing that we're looking for most importantly is actually assets. So if you want our best pricing, we want you to have assets, meaning liquid assets, cash. That's the number one thing we are looking for. Now, there are clients who, who come to us every day. I review scenarios that don't meet our normal matrix. I review them personally. Um, uh, if they don't meet our normal matrix, we do those all the time with people who don't have a lot of cash. But if you want our best pricing, that's the number one thing we want. The next most important thing we are going to look for is loan to value. How much do you want to borrow? Do you want to borrow 75% of the ARV? I mean, if you move this to 65% of the ARV, I mean, you're borrowing a lot less from us. We like that. There's more cushion. Um, so um, if someone's looking to do their first transaction, the first thing we recommend they do is with us or some other lender is that they go and get themselves pre-approved or get a, get a commitment letter from a lender. You wouldn't go to the mall. You wouldn't go to the gallery or the mall without knowing how much cash you have or how much money you have to spend. You shouldn't look for real estate investments without having that either. <coughs> you, you need to know how much because you don't want to waste your time on a seller's side. You don't want to ruin your reputation with a seller that might have great deals in the future by trying to buy their property that you can't afford right now. Or the other way around, you may not want to look at a, you know, really ugly, hairy deals, really tricky transactions, when you can really upgrade to that and get into commercial financing now. Why not make the leap now? You don't have to do a residential property. You don't have to start that way if you don't want to. Uh, you can. You, it's best to probably have a blend of both, actually, because there's an up and down for both those markets. That was more than you needed. You asked me, but... A quick follow-up. So when someone approaches you, is it best that they already have the deal uh, they have a deal that they're working on, they know what they want to do with it, they come to you ready to go, or do you actually work with them? We'd love to know them first. We'd love to know if, if they can go, if we can, the, the, it's no different than, than going to the doctor. If we can, we, we do annual checkups, we do annual reviews with our clients, we'd rather know, know early on what issues you might have, because if we can get you to a better place, and you don't have a transaction, we'll tell you what to work on now so that you're ready by the time you do have a transaction. Or if you want to improve your pricing, maybe you want just the lowest 
bottom of the barrel pricing. You you want us to give you a give it a loan with no interest. That does not happen. <laughs> but uh, uh, but you, um, but if you want that type of you want that type of pricing, just bottom of the barrel, like you're loaning to your your mother, kind of loans, right? Um, then we'll tell you what it takes to get there. And so to answer your question, we recommend they come to us soon, not late. Uh, you want to call and you want to close that transaction in five days. If we've already done a loan for you or you're already in our system, that process goes so much faster because the first day is going to be nothing but you onboarding in our system. It'll be us getting you into the system versus you already being there. We've already saved a day of, of the process or a couple hours of the first day, I should say, of the process. It doesn't take that long. People do it all the time. Can you, uh, we have a couple questions on Facebook. Can you talk about uh, hard money loans, how they work for buy and hold purposes? Yeah, great. That's favorite, favorite uh, conversation. It's the reason why we are a traditional mortgage bank and a non-traditional lender. Because in this scenario that I've been showing earlier, and I, I, uh, my wife tells my kids to write for the reader, and I didn't do a good job of that right now. <laughs> um, um, but, um, but, I, but you can get this scenario, right, that you'd only be in this transaction. You, the property costs 60000 it costs you twenty five to fix it up and 5000 closing costs. You'd only have a loan of $90,000 from, uh, that's how much you need, wherever you've got it. You know, a private money lender, your own cap, whatever. But let's just assume for a moment you got this loan from Zeus Crowdfunding. And if you have a loan out saying for $90,000 and now the house is worth one i I'm going to have to take down the Wells Fargo scenario. Is there Here. something I can use? Thanks. You got it. This is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite conversations right here. Because in this scenario, you went back to Wells Fargo Bank or Zeus Mortgage Bank. And you have this, you only take, take, get rid of all this, get rid of all this. You have a loan out for $90,000. That's how much you borrowed on a property worth one sixty-five. The property's worth one sixty-five now. That's the value. And you can typically borrow, let's just go with 80%. On a long-term loan, so a buy and hold, that says 80%. Uh, Paul, can you cue that for me? So you get a loan from Zeus Mortgage Bank at 132 or Bank of America, whoever you have your banking relationship with. That's your new loan. But... There's a pro and this is going to be a loan at what's the rate today? Uh, four sixty-five. So we'll go with four six four point six percent. That's the rate on a thirty-year. But you only owe ninety thousand dollars on your ZCF loan, your Zeus Crafting loan, which means you get forty-two thousand dollars in cash at closing to do your next investment. Or, if you don't want to take the cash, you can just keep the loan at $90,000. It doesn't matter. You have a much lower loan to value, so your interest rate would actually even go lower. But the, you would convert this into a long-term loan, um, and you would be able to get your next investment potentially with cash, right? You, had a, you, had a, you could almost buy another deal cash off the financing of this. And by the way, you'd still in this scenario have about $32,000 in equity, right? It's worth one sixty-five, dollars and you only borrowed one thirty-two. dollars This is the government. We're looking at rolling out something between here, midterm months. It should be done in the next 30 days, we hope. So it'll, it'll be an option for people who don't quite meet the checkbox type underwriting. And I imagine most of your investors still, or some of your investors don't, not all, I don't know. But so that some. new vehicle has a little bit higher interest rate? It has lower interest rates than this. This is a risky loan because you're paying for $25,000 to fix it up. So you're really buying an ugly property and putting $25,000 in, which almost 50% of the property's purchase prices and repairs. That's a pretty big number, right? Um, so this is a higher interest rate. This would be a lower interest rate, and it would be a longer term. Five, seven, ten years, like a bank would give you. And it'll roll over seamlessly. Great question. Do you have a cash reserve requirement for like what they uh, can't go off of? We, we do. We, um, we like, um, and Paul, you can help me edit these uh, if I say, uh, say something that uh, isn't accurate. But my, uh, we want, we're going to take you from 15 all the way to 50% uh, capital requirements or asset requirements. So let me give you an example. Um, in this transaction, the total cost is 
60 plus uh, 25, that's a, what we call the total cost. This is a known definition in construction lending or hard money. The known total cost is 85,000, right? So if we might, on this transaction, depending on your profile, want 15% of that for you, we want you to have that in cash somewhere. 12,700. So we have a requirement of no less than 15K, but you'd only need 12, uh, 13,000 actually on this deal based on that. And it moves up from there based on our pricing. So we'd want you to have that somewhere that we can see it. Remember, to us, that's the most important factor in our pricing. It's some kind of liquid asset. Right? Liquid assets, okay. yeah. Not in a car or jewelry or, or uh, baseball cards or uh, <laughs> whatever. Something that we can see. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the best ever is the person who says they have cash under their mattress, and you're like, yeah, we've heard that before. And then they send their bed with $100 bills spread all over it in stacks. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, we really do. It's like, okay, they weren't lying. <laughs> they really do have, uh, have mattress money. Um, so um, uh, we need to be able to see it and verify it if we, if we want to. Great question. What else you have for me? I'm on a roll. Come on. Is it crowdfunding? It seems to be becoming a bigger and bigger phenomenon. A lot of people are using it. I how long have you guys been in it, and how are you seeing it change and get better? Great. So it's thanks to uh, the Jobs Act. Uh, what the Jobs Act did in the United States is it enabled um, companies to solicit funds openly on the web. You know, prior to the Jobs Act, you could not do that. You could not solicit money on a website. You could not say, "Here's an investment for you to take a look at." That was not legal in the United States. Uh, in fact, in what's exciting is in most. Uh, European, Eastern European and Asian countries, crowdfunding has been around for a very long time. In fact, we're the smallest market player. Can you? It's hard to believe, but we're the smallest platform for crowdfunding, crowdfunding in the world. So uh, I think about the, the industry is about 40 billion in lending. I think it's about, I want to say about three or four billion in real estate. The, the largest growth area is going to be real estate related. Um, We've been doing this for two years. It took us about a year to develop our platform to the status that it is to now. It is today, and like you all, we are working on it every single day, uh, and we find something to change and to improve every day. I envisioned that when we were, we, we would one day have something and it would be complete, like a model car or something. Oh, everybody, look at this! It's amazing. But no, nope, every day something happens with it that we have to change. Uh, um, and luckily for you, that's why we're, uh, we're talking. That's lucky for us, I guess I should say. Uh, lucky for every developer uh, who has to help us. <laughs> otherwise, known, otherwise known as job security. Um, uh, so we've been doing this for about two years, our crowdfunding. We've been doing crowdfunding for about 15, I'm sorry, hard money for 15 years. Uh, but we transitioned into crowdfunding two years ago. And what is the benefit of the, the people who invest the money into the deal? Um, Great question. They get a concierge experience of investing in transactions that we've pre-vetted and pre-funded with our own cash, our own company money. Um, and we offer guaranteed and non-guaranteed options, meaning we will guarantee their investment in a transaction. Um, so they get a very good yield, secured by a piece of real estate that they could drive by if they lend. If they invest in their city, they could go buy the property and say, oh, this is one, two, three Smith Street. I invested in that. And they put all or a portion of the money in and they'll get yield somewhere between 11 and 14% annually in a semi-liquid investment. So what investment options do you have that are secured by real estate, first liens in real estate, that you get somewhere between 11 and 14% yield, that, you, um, that the company will offer you a guaranteed option to guarantee you in case you're in a case of a loss, they'll guarantee what you've earned, uh, and that's semi-liquid. I, I don't know, we don't know of another one. Uh, and that's why investors are flocking to crowdfunding. I mean, if you're an investor in the market, uh, Real estate, all investors, whether you're in the market, stock market or equity market, mutual fund market, it doesn't matter. Would you rather make 11 to 14, you know, very secured or even guaranteed? We're the only company that offers a guaranteed option, but there are other companies that are very reliable and offer secured uh, or secured but not guaranteed. There's a difference. Guaranteed is the company's guaranteeing your money. Secured is you just have the property to guarantee your investment. As in crowdfunding, we offer both options. So um, what's better than that today? I don't, I don't know of anything. And you're investing in a specific deal when the loan for that deal is done. You, you get your money back. Your money but you can back. also get your money back earlier. Okay. So if, for example, you what we call an emergency liquidation, you can you can have your money you can have your money back earlier um, if you need it. Okay. We Great. have a question kind of related to this. As a non-accredited investor, how much can I put into one of your crowdfunding deals? So five thousand dollars. If you're non-accredited, five thousand dollars is the maximum 
you can put into a single investment. What is non-accredited? Great, that question. <laughs> we won't get too far into the details of that. It simply means that you have the you, the, you meet the governance definition for being someone who can make a sophisticated investment decision. It's a, it's a, there's, a, there's a list of questions that you would answer okay. to, to determine. And then we have another question. Um, are HUD money loans only restricted to residential properties? No, they are not. And actually, when Alex was asking me the question earlier about uh, uh, something about getting started, um, just one of the things that I love getting investors to do, and it's where they'll, they'll all, they almost always you know, lose it. Don't lose it in here or watching. If you're watching, do not lose what I'm about to show you. Don't, don't lose this. If you just imagine there were a couple more zeros on here, like 165 million. He borrowed, he borrowed the money on a hard money loan and he got a $4 million rehab budget when he bought it. And then he later sold the property, I think, for $125 million. Uh, when, when Oprah Winfrey was doing an investment of a ranch, she borrowed from a temp to perm lender to do the acquisition of the property and fix it up. And the list goes on and on and on. People, remember, it's not just people who have the cash. There's other reasons, whether it's speed or they want to conserve their capital or they don't need a traditional box. They will maintain them, maintain their cash in their pocket. So don't get the answer to the question, Katie, that you asked me on, on Facebook was, can you do this for other types of property other than residential real estate? And the answer is yes, commercial, multifamily. We, in fact, we, you know, we encourage you to do it. Great question. I love that question. It's my favorite. And one more on Facebook. Um, how would you best comfort someone who is uncertain or new to the process about noticed or seen someone close on mortgage, even though there's a lot of paperwork, a lot, like a big stack. Yeah. Uh, for a crowdfunding loan, there's a lot less. For a hard money loan, there's less. And then for a crowdfunding loan, it's very thin, right? Not as thin, not, it's not nothing, but it's about buying a car, okay? Plus a couple other addendums, papers. The most important paper to read in all of those papers is which paper? If you've bought, a, if you purchased a house before, this is a question for you too. What's the most important document? I mean, you're going to get document after document. That when it goes south, what's going to be enforced? What's in that? That's, that two-page, three-page document is most important. And as long as everything in that document aligns with what they were told in the beginning, then I think they'll be great. And in most cases, there are very few bad actors still left in lending. I can't speak to the private money lending side, um, I can't speak to that because there, there's not a lot of vetting that goes with them, right? But they're great private money lenders. There are many great, great, great private money lenders. I can't speak to them, but on the institutional side like us, the organized side, there are very few bad actors. I would tell, the, tell them to um, go with someone that they were referred to or that they trust and, uh, and read the promise here note. Make sure it matches what they were told. Other Facebook questions, other questions in here? I have a question. Why, why is there less paperwork for the crowdfunding as opposed to personal? Traditional loans gonna, is, it's regulated by the government. Oh. So, <laughs> right? So the three greatest <laughs> lies ever told, do you know this? Three greatest lies ever told. Number one, I'll love you the same in the morning. Uh, uh, number, second greatest lie ever told is uh, the checks in the mail. Every real estate investor knows that one. And the third greatest lie ever told is that I'm with the government and I'm here to help. Um, and so, um, um, just kidding, of course, on two of the three of those. Um, um, and so, um, this is a traditional loan, and so there's a lot more to sign. When you're signing something for 30 years, there's a lot of commitments they got to get from you. A lot of things they have to verify. What other questions do you have? Um, Stephen, we, since we brought up the government, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a big uh, transitional period for us as a country, um, and uh, I'm really curious to hear from you what you think some of the trends that are coming up, that are forming now, how will that impact the real estate industry and lending in particular? So, um, uh, Trump has mentioned in the past that he is going to repeal portions, if not all, of the Dodd-Frank Act. That would change real estate investing and lending dramatically because the reason why this is very taxing uh, is because of there, there are so many government requirements. Now, I also just said there are very few bad actors. 
and you can rest assured that there's a lot of oversight from the government making sure you don't get taken advantage of in this space. In this space, not so much here, but definitely here. If he removes that, I think you'll see a flood. I mean, if you've seen the big short or some of the other movies that, or, you know, uh, people gave loans to dogs and things like that. And we have our own stories that, uh, that Paul and I can tell you of things that are absolutely crazy that we heard about that happened during that time. Uh, you open the window for that. And I assure you, no matter what that car salesman, Al Goody's doing right now, selling cars, he will flood right back to real estate lending if the market opens up and he has opportunity. Um, so I hope he doesn't do that. I hope he was just uh, giving lip service. But one thing that at least I've learned with no political affiliation, uh, one way or the other right here, one thing I've learned is that when Trump says something, you better believe him. Uh, he is not speaking figuratively, he's speaking literally. So when he said a wall, a lot of people thought he was just speaking metaphorically, he was not, uh, as you may, may have heard. So if he's gonna repeal part of it, he probably will. And what is the impact for us? I think you'll see more lending opening, so you'll see more real estate transactions happening. But you'll also just see more abuse, so that's what will come from that. So do I like all the laws that are over here, and all the compliances over here? No, I do not, but I know a lot of it's necessary. I don't like speed limits either. Um, 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 but since I'm the only person who knows how to drive, uh, um, I need them to sort of protect me from you. Uh, so, so, um, so um, I think we need it. I think he would be, he'd be making a mistake. Now, if he does do what he says, and he's so far done everything that he said he was going to do, um, or started the process of doing that, if he does do that, I think it'll be good for real estate investors. I think they'll enjoy more money. That paired with increasing interest rates might be very important. If interest rates go up, but you have more money available or easier money available, it might keep real estate moving forward. Uh, right now, a lot of markets are cooling off. So you, around the country, you, you probably know this better than we do. A lot of markets are, are starting to cool, and if they cool and interest rates go up, that's not a very good recipe. Um, now, for experienced investors, it is. New investors, it's kind of ironic. It could be a very good time for them because people are gonna get scared. And as Warren Buffett said, you should be greedy when other people are scared and scared when other people are greedy. Well, if the market starts getting, interest rates go higher and other markets cool off. I mean, Houston's market's beginning to cool, as you know. So as that happens, people will get spooked. They might want to sell out. I got a text message on the way over here from an experienced investor who said, I'm thinking about Sun's property. I'm worried about where the market's going. Well, if, you're, if you are a new real estate investor, that spells opportunity for you. So I think it's positive from what I can tell. That being said, I know that all markets, what goes up goes down in a capitalistic economy. Uh, and so at some point we'll have a recession the next maybe three or four years from now. And when that happens, um, I think there'll be even more opportunity for real estate investors. I don't think you should wait to buy that. A deal's a deal at any market. And, and real estate investors start and jump in the market at any time, they don't wait. I'm just saying there will be more deals if a correction comes. Great, what else you got for me? I'm gonna bring this to another learning breakfast we had where um are you seeing similar trends on your side in terms of you know commercial lending versus the So great question. I don't know if everyone can hear the hear the question, but it's really a good one. And so are residential. It's the first three rules of all real estate are what? Location. Thank you. So it really depends on where the property is located to answer that question. If you give me a property in Miami, I don't care what market we're in, we like the property, we know that no matter what happens, the property value is gonna return. It's gonna escalate. Give me a property in LA, uh, we just know it's solid. It might drop like a, can of or a ton of bricks when the market turns, but it'll also be the first market, one of the first markets to return. We know, uh, you hear a lot about office space and how much office space is available, like a million or 10 million square feet in Houston that's available because of the oil correction. But try leasing office space inside uh, the loop and see where, where rates have done. They've not dropped, they've held very strong. If we look at occupancy of multifamily, if you go outside the loop, the, or, or at, in, in, outside the loop in B and C quality property, you're gonna see uh, 93, 94% occupancy. Now you get into A class property outside the loop and you're gonna see occupancies in the 80s. That's pretty scary. So now you're, you've, you've, hit, you've gone below the 90% mark. So I, as it cooled off, I think it depends on where. Try buying an office building inside the loop in Houston or an uptown area of Dallas, downtown area of Dallas, and I'll tell you it's, it will feel like it's you know, 2014 and everything's on fire. Uh, there's, it's very competitive. Property, commercial property in, inside the loop in Houston, 
I called on two properties for something about two weeks ago, about a week ago, excuse me. The properties were under contract within three days. Office buildings, not houses. In three days, they were gone, off the market. Uh, so I, don't, I think it depends on where uh, you, you're looking to buy. Follow up to that or no, did I get it? Yeah, in that same learning breakfast that Ken mentioned, um, they talked about the residential market following the commercial market. So when the commercial market goes down, you can expect a couple years from that, the residential will follow. Do you see the same? Uh, I don't have any statistics, so I'm gonna say this uh, only from my own past experience. Um, I can tell you that uh, commercial was booming in 2007, uh, just like residential. Uh, and when commercial fell, it fell, residential uh, lending, so the money in the market went down about 30 to 40 percent in 2000, from 2006 to 2008. That's how much it declined. Uh, any guesses on how much commercial money transacted in that same time period? What was the decline? Any guess? 50? 90 percent. Oh, wow. That's how much less was happening. So I, uh, this is awkward. Um, <laughs> did you get my, did you click this in my, uh, um, sorry guys. <laughs> and I know the ringer and so it's, that's my boss calling, otherwise known as my wife. Um, uh, see how it was really gentle, right? Yeah. See how the ringer is like gentle? See, no matter what trouble I'm in, when you hear a ringer like that, you're calm. You know? So I'm calm. even though my phone's ringing right now during this, I, it's totally calm. <laughs> totally good. I had, I select the ringer that's the most peaceful. Um, um, so um, I, I think I, I think that I don't think that you can say one's further ahead than the other. I think if you're looking for some recession indi uh, indicators or correction indicators, or you're looking for whether you're in a healthy market or not, you want to look at job growth, population growth, um, and you want to look at the yield curve. The yield curve, at least in the United States, in the in the modern world, has inverted. The yield curve is inverted. I won't go into that right now, uh, but the yield curve is inverted usually within two years of a correction. Uh, meaning short-term loans become, uh, long-term loans become less expensive than short-term loans. So anyway, that's, I'm not an economist, uh, but I do think you wanna follow jobs to know. A lot like, so I mean, not necessarily only purchase, but what about new construction? Have you seen it within your you know, uh, experience of uh, new construction, construction that that's still down, or is that still, I mean, depending on what um, I, I think that there's still plenty of uh, institutional money trying to give construction money, even in Houston, which I know not everyone watching is from Houston, but our high-rise uh, construction is, I would arguably say it's out of control. Uh, and, um, and there are a lot of vacancies that developers are putting on the cuff for now on the hopes that they're gonna be able to fill them later. Um, whether that'll keep going, I don't know, but I, as far as new developments, they're still breaking ground. So there's still money out for new development. On the residential construction, uh, most of those loans are funded by community and regional banks. And community and regional banks are, are typically hypersensitive to oil prices. So a lot of new con residential construction has been cut back from smaller builders, specifically because of oil and gas, not because of some other reason with the market. And as oil returns, they'll get more confidence and more bravado, and as that happens, they'll start lending more. Even before we're in a correction. It's not because they're worried about a correction, they're worried about oil prices. Great. Are you guys seeing any trends on exit strategies on the investing side? Are you seeing a lot more holds? Are you still seeing a lot of flips going back to the retail market? Great, great question. What was that? The question was, what are we seeing as exit strategies in the market now? Uh, I do a speaking engagements, not very often, but semi, and I, I, I usually will ask a group of investors, you, know, you have a couple of hundred investors in a room, how many of you are here to learn more about fix and flip versus buy and hold? And you can really tell something about the market. It's a small sample, of course, but how many people have now transitioned to buy and hold? Mm -hmm. uh, they are now looking to hold on. Um, and I think that's just a sentiment of a little bit of uncertainty. It's, it's, it's kind of product, counterintuitive to the market, but I think as people are a little bit more nervous, they're like, let me just hold on to that. Let me just hold on to that. Um, I, I, exit strategy wise, I, the, probably the biggest trend I see is people up uh, transitioning into commercial faster. Buying residential, keeping their residential eye open all the time. I mean, I'm an investor, and I always have my eye open to residential property if it comes up. It's not what I normally do, it's not what I do at all, but I keep my, my eye and my ear open for that. I think more people are transitioning sooner than they ever have before into commercial. That's a definitely a big trend. And I also see people uh, partnering um, 
uh, more than they ever had before. With the internet, there's more information to be shared and more people are getting together working on their synergies uh, um, than, I, than I've seen in my career at least. Getting into property together, buying out partners, you can get into a deal together and one of the partners may want to leave. Well, if we got into this deal together, remember about four hours ago, I went over this scenario. Um, it feels like four hours up here. Uh, um, um, uh, we were in the scenario where you got $42,000 cash. If we went into this deal as partners, and I think that there's 32K in the deal, I mean $30,000 profit in the deal, we might agree at this moment, look, give me my fifteen dollars to $20,000, you own the property on your own, you get to keep it, and I get my cash, and I can go do my next deal on my own. I see a lot more of that happening, a lot of partnerships in, in and out together. I see the opposite also, I see where investors go in on their own and they get out with a partner. They bring someone in for the credit to get out and share this money with them on their way out. Um, so I think th those are two biggest trends. Aside from crowdfunding and the explosion of that, um, you asked a question earlier, and I, I didn't take it, kick the can all the way down the road for that, but about crowdfunding as a trend. It's not a trend. It will arguably, in, our, in, our, in everyone in this room, uh, uh, our lifetime, we will see a, uh, we will end up seeing crowdfunding being the source of almost all consumer debt. When you get a credit card or a car loan or buy a boat, you're gonna get it. They're already, if you're a dentist and you wanna start, you wanna launch your new practice, you're gonna get a loan from a crowdfunding platform. It's cheaper than a bank. There are cr credit cards that are cheaper than a bank. There are car loans cheaper than a bank. Why would you not just, it, the, it's, it's, it's not going anywhere. Now, it's also highly unregulated, um, which, will, which means that it'll, have another ripple effect, the same one I was talking about in this one over here. It, unfortunately, it costs a lot of money to create a crowdfunding platform, so not everyone is doing it the way they were jumping into the mortgage industry uh, in 2002 and three and four. Great. And are you seeing an increase of people dumping money into crowdfunding? To yes, yes. Hedge funds are looking, uh, yes. I mean, a lot of institutions are looking for this because, again, they have been going only B2B business to business or business to their current investor list, when you have a platform that you've opened up to consumers, it's very valuable to them. So yes, I, I see it. Be, I see community banks who are who would love to make you a loan over here, but they can't because there's two, you don't meet one of the check boxes. There's a, there is a movement of community banks, small banks who are creating their own crowdfunding platforms. There are companies who only service that segment of the market because they know that if they do this over here, they can still make the same or more money, but not have to deal with all the government regulation on this side. Is there any foreseeable regulation in crowdfunding that you are anticipating? There are some, y yes, it is regulated by the SEC. I don't want to mean that there's nothing. There's actually more regulation in crowdfunding than hard money. There's more regulation for crowdfunding than there's for hard money or private lending. There's virtually no regulation for private money lending or hard money lending. But do, with crowdfunding, there is it is regulated by the SEC, and there have been a case, uh, there was a case within the last three months where the SEC did come after a crowdfunding platform for a violation. So I, I think you'll see more and more of that as uh, corrections happen in different markets and people don't get their money back. So if you invest in a crowdfunding site and they don't want to give you your money back because their note's not performing, uh, you're going to call the SEC. Well, I think that's what is our, you've seen one happen in the last ninety days. So going back to your um, situations over here, we have a Facebook question. Um, with these numbers, or you can use different ones, what are the typical terms, timeframes, and interest rates with both hard money and crowdfunding? I know they're very similar, but are there any Yeah, ones? great. Hard money, uh, it depends on the market that you're in, so what city and state you're in. But on average, you're gonna be looking at 14 points interest and four points. So you'll, the interest rate will be 14%. That really spooks people, so I'll speak about that. Uh, it's less than many credit cards, but it still speaks, spooks people. And four, four points crowdfunding. We have a March Madness, uh, uh, that's our March Madness, for example, for us, is 9.5% and 1.5 points. That shows you the disparity in terms, right? Um, now, we get a lot of people who will give kick, uh, a little pushback when they hear terms like that, because they feel like it's too high and they're too, they're too strong of a borrower or they have too much strong of a credit profile to ever want to borrow at 14%. Totally agree. Except if you want to do a deal uh, like this where you have to put no money in the deal versus doing a deal like this where, remember, you, this uh, first scenario, you had to bring $45,000 to the table, it will cost you a little bit more in fees. That's just how the reality of it. So with the flexibility comes an increased cost, and that's going to happen regardless. 
The other thing is looking at the cost to bring in a partner. So if I see this deal and I know that I can get forty-two thousand dollars cash plus seventy uh, forty-two thousand dollars cash at closing plus thirty thousand dollars in equity, which is actually thirty-two, that means that I'd have seventy-four thousand dollars in profit in this deal when I'm done. Is it worth me paying fourteen percent, right, per month, uh, um, annualized, so a month, um, which would cost me on this scenario? I'm guessing. I'm gonna guess it's gonna cost me $300 more a month to have this loan on a crowdfunding loan versus a traditional loan. I have no money invested, and it, maybe it'll take me six months to do it. So am I willing to pay $1,800 in more interest plus over six months, um, plus let's just say another $2,000 in fees? I, I don't know the numbers. I'm just giving you a scenario. Am I willing to pay $3,800 more to have no money invested and have $72,000 in equity by myself versus should I bring in a partner who's gonna split this with me and now I have to give them $32,000 and I get $32,000? The answer is I'd rather do it by myself and keep the money for myself. And most smart investors have learned this lesson when they look at the numbers. A lot of new investors who are going to your platform, going to your site, they're getting, their, their knee-jerk reaction is that's too expensive when they look at hard money. But if they look at the math all the way through, this is just, just a much smarter viable option. Remember, I've had no money invested here, and when I get my new loan, and I'm making my new payment on the 132, I'm gonna guess it's $800 a month. I don't know what it is. $800 at you know, 132 at 4.6, we could figure it out. And you're leasing this property for $1,600 a month. You know, Before tax and insurance, you're making $800. You need tax and insurance coming out, coming out of that, but you've invested no money and you walked away with 42,000 bucks. It's pretty amazing. Why would somebody not do crowdfunding and do hard money instead? Uh, comfort, comfort. Is there tax reasons though also? There are no tax dif differential on a borrower site at all. No, no difference. Is it, it like a homestead, like it's your only property? And you don't own your own? So uh, uh, if, if, it, if you're borrowing, most hard money, and crowdfunding won't lend you on a on a homesteaded property, a property you're going to you you. Oh. So that that's a, that's not an issue. I think most people don't do uh, crowdfunding compared to hard money lending because it's something new and they have they barely heard about it. No one wants to be the test subject. Uh, no one wants to be on the bleeding edge of something. But this is their chance to be on the cutting edge and get some of the best uh, best pricing ever. I mean, nine and a half percent. At one half percent in closing in four or five days is something that the market is just not seen. It's just not familiar with. Um, it's pretty pretty amazing stuff. Other questions? Anything else? So, if you're a crowdfunded investor, does the money go? Is it like Kickstarter where if the deal doesn't fail, that money goes back? To the no, because we pre-fund the deal. So, like in Kickstarter, everyone's refunded. But on Zeus Crowdfunding and other real estate real estate debt sites, we offer debt. We don't partner with you. It's a great um, uh, caveat that I need to mention to you. It's very important. I almost didn't mention it at all. There are actually three types of real estate crowdfunding sites. There are debt sites where they offer debt only. They're not your partner. They're not your. They're only your lender. They don't get any of the plus that you put in. They only get their money back, and that's it. They don't get any of that forty-two thousand or that third thousand. They just get their money back. They lend you. There's a second type which is an equity uh, crowdfunding platform. And an equity crowdfunding platform, they are your partner. They will lend you the money, they get their money back plus interest, plus they get part of your upside, part of your profit. And the third type is a blend, where they want do a little bit of both, kind of how I just referenced. We are only, we are only as a company a debt platform, which means we're not your partner. That's a benefit to you. We are not sharing the profit. You get all the upside by yourself. We get a guaranteed of what we're going to get on our interest rate, and our points, we take the risk and you get the rest, however successful it is. You make a million dollars on your deal, it's yours. So a really important factor. If you, look, if you go to ZeusCrowdfunding.com right now under View Investments, you can see all the investments we've already funded and how full they are. That is an investment we have already funded. So if you participate partially and it doesn't fill all the way up, as a company, we fill it all the way up. Okay. We don't give the money back until the transaction pays off. Great question. What else? So for a newer investor, and I mean, so in this, in the crowdfunding situation, they're not investing any of their own money, but they do have to have some 
cash. They right? might they might have to invest. This was just a, I picked a very okay. good scenario. Okay. <laughs> it's a present. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm giving you a presentation, right? Yes. Uh, this is like that ironing thing. The 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 uh, what is it? The steam cleaner in, in the uh, in the in the mall. That guy can get wrinkles out of everything. You take it at home and he can't get like one wrinkle out of the back of your sport coat. So it's that scenario. I'm giving you the best example. Uh, not the best, but a great example. So how much money does, so for a new investor who's never done a deal before, how much money do they have to have to, to pay for closing costs, pay for the cost of hard money loan, what other fees could be involved? So it, you asked me like five questions right there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> the first, how much money do they need? The, remember for a company like ours, we want a minimum $15,000 in cash, liquid somewhere mm -hmm. that they have, okay? Uh, preferably where we can verify not under a mattress. Um, um, but you asked how much do they have to bring to the closing table, right? How much will they need to bring to closing? It depends. Are they, is this property, I said before it was worth 165 when they fixed it up, but what if it's only worth 100? What if they're buying it for 60, spending 25 to fix it and 5,000 closing costs, what if it's only worth 100 when they're done? And of, of course we know how to, we can tell this number up front. It's not a surprise. But if they get 75%, that means they're only getting $75,000. Well, they need 90 to do the deal. So they, in this scenario, would have to bring $15,000 to closing. So it, it, I, it's not depends on, like, I'm, we're going we're gonna to trick you later. One thing about our, our company is we actually disclose everything. We're very transparent. That's one of the benefits I love about, I love, love, love about crowdfunding, is that the industry has brought a whole other level of transparency to the marketplace, which I think is important and I think it's beneficial. People over here in traditional loans get taken advantage of, like the questions earlier, because there's no transparency. But if you really make things simple and transparent, it's hard for someone to be taken advantage of, and you just know all, all, all the teeth uh, before you get in. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, you would know the LT, the, the loan to value that we're willing to lend, and you would know the ARB before we got started and the cash you need to close. We actually would give you this in options. Um, so if someone needs fifteen thousand dollars in liquid for you to consider loaning to them, does that would a self-directed IRA count as liquid cash, or you're talking like has to be your checking account available? Great question. <laughs> Did you put her up to that? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> the answer is it depends. Okay. We don't like retirement assets for liquid available liquid assets. Um, we prefer to see them liquid. That being said, I receive scenarios every single day where someone has uh, retirement assets that our loan committee has to make as an exception. So the loan committee looks at those loans and makes a judgment call. Great. I, back to the transparency, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that even our pricing is on our website. If you're watching right now, you wanna see what your interest rate would be. Other, aside from March Madness, if you go to zeuscrowdfunding.com and on the right, it'll say rate. You can get your rate based on your profile anytime you want. That's how transparent it is. So there's no hidden secret going on. You tell us your profile, we'll tell you what your rate would be. Aside from March Madness, which is our first time, um, uh, our first time investor uh, program, you, if you're a first time investor with us, we are gonna give you below market terms. In fact, I think right now we're offering that for every investor, as a matter of fact. But that's also our normal first time investor. So let me say it one more time. For March Madness, we're offering, I think, nine and a half and one and a half um, for every, uh, every investor. But that's our normal first time investor program also. Is that about right? Yes. Great. Great. We have a Facebook question with a scenario. If Bring you it. to go through. Yeah. So it's a multifamily project. How much upfront, upfront money is needed for you to lend on a project between a million and 10 million? That's a huge range. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pick a number somewhere in there. <laughs> um, so, um, Let's pick a million dollar deal. Okay. If they're watching, could they possibly give us what the property will be worth after they're done fixing it up? That would be great. So if you're watching, we'd like to know what it'll be worth. Uh, if you just want to borrow a million bucks, uh, uh, we have to know what the collateral is worth, what the property's worth, not just what you're loaning. That, is that gonna come off? You're good. You're <laughs> okay. We'll charge you for it later. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, moving on. I just asked him. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best at the scenario. Nope. 
Oh man. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, he wants to borrow a million. One million. So the question is how, how much? Without knowing, we'll wait from the reply on how much it's worth or going to be worth and how much repairs it needs. If you want to borrow on this property, it's a million dollar multifamily, right? An apartment complex. If you want to borrow on the one million apartment complex and it's worth two million dollars, call us. The only thing you'll need to pay up front is the appraisal to a third party. You're not paying it to our company and we'll close it in a couple of days. You don't need anything to fix it up. You don't, it's just, it's worth two million. You only owe a million and you, or you want to borrow a million on it. You're going to, maybe you're buying it for two million. Without knowing, you're going to need a couple of things to, to actually run a scenario and get accurate numbers. And so as an investor, as a new investor to be responsible, they're going to want to know <coughs> what they think the property is going to be worth when they fix it up. And MyHouseDeals.com actually puts the ARV from the seller, right? Mm -hmm. So they have an estimated, estimated ARV. They need estimated repairs. And once we start with that, then we can say, okay, how much will you, will you need to be able to borrow approximately? Um, we, without, without having that, it's almost impossible for me to tell. I'll give you a different scenario. The same million dollar loan that he wants. If it's only wor worth 800000 he should call somebody else. Because <laughs> even crowdfunding can't help him. Without knowing what it's going to be worth, it's hard for me to, uh, what, what, uh, what the scenario will work. What scenario will work, excuse me. And does a situation like this, does it also get judged on your score that you talked about earlier? Your Z-score? Yeah. The algorithm will tell us, that takes into consideration how, what is the LTV, right? We, we're right. going to give an LTV based on the value. We use LTV uh, credit score, actually. Liquid reserves, I told you earlier. That says liquid reserves. Um, and a few other factors that are in the algorithm. And it gives us a score. Uh, on our site, what you'll notice on all the investments on our site, that are available for you to participate in as an investor, what you'll notice is they're almost all A grade investments, A plus or higher, A grade or higher. We have some Bs, but those are exceptions. And that's based on our score. It's based on what we, a predictability factor of how reliable we think this loan is to perform the way we expect it. That was a long answer. But. And the A, the A score is based on? All of these factors. Yeah. So whatever the weight is for that one. And that borrower would expect, like I said, nine and a half and one and a half percent. If I invested in a B grade property as a crowdfunder, the rate's I, higher. The, okay, would I expect my return to be correct? Higher? You would. It's more risk for us, which means we pass it on to you. Great question. Well, a lot of times investors ask us about what is the um, what is the cost for doing that or setting up the account. One of the things I love to say is there is none with our platform. We don't charge an investor to invest in our platform anything. Um, in fact, we pay them a funding bonus. If someone invests $100,000 in our platform, we actually give them $1,000 uh, um, as a funding bonus, plus whatever interest rate they're getting per month. And we don't charge them for servicing. We don't charge them any fees. We don't charge the The risk is that when a correction comes, if it becomes a recession, that they cannot manage the amount of foreclosures that they are put up against to deal with. And that's when things like our algorithm and our Z-score become important because we have a predictability factor that we're using to know that this property, we can fulfill the loan the way it was expected to be filled when it started. Um, you know, our company indirectly has been through two recessions. So that speaks a lot about our ability to handle that. And if you look at our foreclosure rate, we have best in class underwriting, which means we have a, a lower, uh, when I say lower, I mean much than lower expected default rate in our industry. It's less than 1% of 1%. It is actually lower than that, but we felt like it would look too fake if we said it. <laughs> so we just put 1% of 1%. 0.001% is our default rate. And so I think the, the, the risk is how is the operator? There's a phrase in business investing, which is you bet on the jockey, not just the horse. And in crowdfunding, if you're going to put your money with that company, you really need to look at the jockey. If they're great developers, I think a lot of you are developers. Uh, that's fantastic and you might be great at figuring out algorithms, but if you don't know how to underwrite something, underwriting sounds easy, but there wouldn't be industries who live and die by the practice if it was so simple. Um, underwriting makes the difference. That is, I mean, we hang our head on that in a big way. And so you, you need to know they know how to underwrite. We've seen, lo we, we lose loans, meaning people come to us and we won't do a loan and we think that the borrower shouldn't even be doing the transaction. It's not a good transaction for them. Forget the, not the, not the, bar, the borrower's great. 
But the transaction is actually not a deal. We can't tell you it's not a deal, it's not our job. We can tell you it doesn't meet our criteria. We'll see them go somewhere else and get the money in you know, three or four weeks from another site. And we just know they're gonna lose money. We can't say that exactly. We can show them a chart that says, uh, you will lose money, but we can't say <laughs> you will lose money. And some, they'll go to another lender and get the money. And people, other investors are behind them investing their money to buy that loan that we won't, we won't, we wouldn't touch it. That happens regularly. Great. We got some numbers on our situation. Here. I so, love that you call these situations. Sorry. No, I like it. Scenario. No, you can call it a situation. I like it. <laughs> he says the NOI. Okay, he's gonna try to go fancy on us. Yeah. I'm gonna have to, I don't, I don't know how much time I have, but I don't know if I have time to discuss NOI. Um, uh, okay, tell me the numbers. The NOI, a million, eight ninety seven, six ninety six. Super specific. <laughs> I like this guy. Is this Paul? Paul? <laughs> Paul, are you messing with me? Is this you? <laughs> uh, Do you have a fake pro <laughs> Facebook profile? <laughs> okay. okay. So let's see about that. Okay, a million, uh, the NOI. A million, eight ninety seven, six ninety six. Let's just go with two million. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Cap rate eight percent. Okay. And he adds that it's student housing. Okay. Uh, where we need know, we would like to know where it is. Uh, um, he's watching. We want to know where it is. Can I get uh, can I get uh, two million divided two million divided by point zero eight? He still didn't give us what he's purchasing it for and how much it needs to be fixed up also. A, a million is what I think we're assuming Okay. based on his first question. Two million divided by point zero zero eight. Uh, point zero eight. Uh, 160, 160,000. How much? 160,000. Uh, 25 million. 25. Two million divided by point zero eight yeah. equals 25 million. So this doesn't necessarily match the equation that he gave us. Um, can you take 25 million times 0 0.08? Just make sure for me. Okay, cool. Okay, uh, what does the NOI stand for? I'm getting there. Okay. I figured I wouldn't go. I won't go too far into this, but I'll, I'll touch on it. Okay. Here's the scenario. Um, is this even legible at all? It is. Yeah. Okay, cool. I mean awesome. 25 million is what the value of the property is. The NOI is two million, and the cap rate is eight percent based on what he gave us, and he's buying it for a million. So at the purchase price, we can assume he is, he may be in Maryland. He's assume who? This, the property might be in Maryland. Okay, cool. All right, that's great. Is that where, where he's looking? That's where he's looking. Okay, so a million dollar purchase price, we wish we knew how much it needed to, uh, we needed to know what he was, we don't know if this is it, and we don't know the repairs, uh, and we don't know the current occupancy. So, the cool, thing about, the cool thing about commercial transactions is that the numbers are bigger, but there's only a few more questions you need to get in, you need to ask. But the exciting thing is what you make can be you know, 10, 20, 50 times more in a transaction like this. It's more risk, yes, obviously it is more risk. Um, but uh, risk, uh, you, you'll never eliminate risk totally, but the more you know about something, the less risk there is, right? You'll never eliminate risk where you go drive through a neighborhood. You can get carjacked anywhere but you can eliminate the risk by knowing where to go and where not to go. So the same thing here, you, it's always gonna be risky, but you eliminate the risk by knowing where to go and where not to go. Um, so we don't know the repairs yet, and we don't know the purchase price, we don't know the repairs, and we don't know the current occupancy. This would be great to know if this was the, the scenario or how it is right now, because we don't know. But it's okay, because it's a teaching moment anyway. The only numbers he gave us, right, are these two. So NOI stands for net operating income. This is all otherwise known in residential estate as cash flow, right? But the difference is, to make it a little bit more complicated, sorry, I'm gonna say it. <laughs> I didn't wanna go down this rabbit hole, but I will. Is that in commercial, you don't count your debt service, your mortgage payment, to calculate what your net operating income is. That comes after that. So this number is really, I'm making these numbers up, I have no idea. Six million in income. He says the occupancy is 93%. We love it. Very little repairs. Ask him when you'd like to close. 
<laughs> so we're guessing we're guessing six million in income and four million in expenses, right? So this has a ten two million dollar net op sorry net op net operating income. So that's what he's telling us. So cap rate is capitalization rate. The capitalization rate, when you hear it in commercial, is uh, it means how much would I expect to earn on my money if I invested in this all cash? What could I get? Well, if you invested, if you bought, if this property was worth 25 million, you paid 25 million, and you're getting 8% for it per, per year, you could expect to get $2 million in net operating income. That's how they're related to each other. So I know it's right before lunch, so let me try it one more time. <laughs> before you made this investment, if I said, look, I have an investment that'll pay you $2 million a year. It's an 8% return. It's cost 25 million, you, it'll pay 8%, you'll make $2 million a year, that's what he just told us. So I only need two of these three numbers to ever figure out the third number. Kinda? Mm -hmm. Deer. Uh, uh, deer and headlights right there. Um, okay, I'm gonna assume you understood what I said. I think you did, most of you. Um, so, um, we know it's worth 25 million, he's making two million. We don't need to know those numbers, I'll just use that as an example. He's buying it for a million, uh, he, it needs no repairs and 93% occupied. We will give him this and we will give it to him tomorrow at 9.5% uh, at and 1.5%. March Madness, we are crazy, we are going mad. Um, <laughs> in that scenario, he wouldn't have to put any money down. In this scenario, he would bring no money to the table. In fact, if he had repairs, we'd even give him money to fix it up. So if, if this was if this is right, if this is correct, and this is correct, we'd give him money now to even fix it up, to correct, to to make renovations if you wanted. More importantly, for your other uh, people who are listening uh, and watching, you should ask him: Is he willing to take partners from the other people who are paying who are on, online? I said one of the best biggest trends Alex asked me was partnering. There are people probably watching who would love to be part of this deal, or maybe be mentored by him, or maybe learn what he's doing. So it'd be a good chance for him to get uh, other other resources from being on this uh, on this Facebook Live thing. Yeah, cool. This is exciting. It's a good deal. I like it. Um, so when you're selling, here's something fun for you. Cap rates matter. In residential, we talk about location, 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 right? In commercial, we're talking about location, location, location. But the factor for that, it's, it's given, aside from location, but it's not just location, but it's also um, con, uh, upward mobility of the property, highest and best use, things like that. But the cap rate's the expression of how good this deal is. For example, inside the loop retail in Houston, in some places has a cap rate of three to 4%. Meaning you could expect only to earn three to 4% on your, on your 25 million because it's a very strong area. Versus if you go further rural or go to some places in Houston on retail, you might have a cap rate of 15% because your chances of filling the retail center are pretty low. Uh, you're gonna have a lot of turnover in there and you're not gonna be prepared to earn very much but when you have someone in there. So that when you're, if in an ideal scenario, here you'll make 8% on those outside of, um, Cleveland, Texas, uh, you know, you, you probably have a cap rate for a retail center of you know, 12, 14%, I'm guessing, 10 to 14%. Uh, they have to pay you more. When you're buying something, uh, of course you, you want this as high as possible. All right, you wanna be, a, when you're buying something, when I'm buying this property, I want this number as high as possible because I wanna go into the scenario, if I paid cash, how much will I make on my money? But when you're selling something, I know this is not what you wanted to know, but when you're selling something, you really want the cap rate to be as low as possible. Why? Because there's an inverse relationship between NOI and cap rate. Can you do two million divided by 0.04? It's like plus two million the PE on stocks. It'd be yes, it is. Yeah, exactly. It's, right. it's going to be times two. It's 50 million. Your return on your investment. Uh, this property, when you're selling it, you want the cap rate to be as low as possible because you want someone looking for an investment that doesn't pay as much when you're selling. You under, kind of understand? Yeah. That's okay. We'll does come this, back for commercial sometime. Does this only, oh, okay, so that, that was my question. Is this for commercial? Only commercial. Okay, yeah. This is only for commercial property. 
Um, uh, residential property is much more simple. That's why a lot of people are com more comfortable with it. The terms and the jargon is much more commonplace. And people who own their own home are pretty already, they're already exposed to what it's gonna take to buy that property. You know you have a mortgage payment that's pr uh, uh, principal, interest, tax, and insurance. You just add some repairs and then rent it. You know the difference is yours to keep, to go on vacation. But in commercial, there's a few more factors, but not very many more. And I wouldn't let the couple more factors scare you from taking the, taking this little little leap. This is like the baby diving board. <laughs> Great. We have one question. Did we already get that one? Yeah, it's already been answered. Okay. Don't be scared. Ask me. It's AMA, right? Ask me anything. Ask me anything. Yeah. This is your last. This is your last chance. We're wrapping it up. Uh, Stephen, just before we go, you know, as a real estate investor, as someone who works with real estate investors every day, what's the one piece of advice that you always give to someone who's getting started in the business? Ooh. One piece of advice. Um, let fear guide you, uh, not be a roadblock for you. If you have the best investors are the ones who are afraid. Those are the ones who don't lose money and they're here for generations. It's the investors who are not afraid that scare the dickens out of me. They'll just go and buy anything. They'll do anything. So if you're afraid, that's great. Act anyway. Let that fear guide you into making good investments. That's perfectly fine to be afraid. That means you're a good investor. I'm I'm I am a I'm hyper allergic to losing money as an investor and part of my my, what I've learned from other investors is that if you are afraid but you act wisely, um, you, uh, you can mitigate that risk a lot. And so I think let your fear guide you, not stall you, will be a roadblock for you. Move forward anyway. People are looking at your site, I'm sure you know the numbers, I bet this group knows the numbers, of how many people have been a member of your site and not purchased a deal. That's because they'll look at it and it's more fun to daydream and talk about how they can't find one than it is to actually do one. And I'll bet that's pretty common. I mean, I know it's pretty common, not just for your site, but for all investor groups, it's pretty common. Instead of doing that, the ones who, they should stop being afraid. Move, let that fear put them on the path to doing something that, they're gonna be afraid to do it, of course. We're always afraid to do something new that involves risk. Mitigate the risk as much as you can, lower it as much as you can, and keep driving, you know? That's, that's my advice. Move forward anyway, with fear. Awesome. Great advice. All right. Uh, all right, Stephen, if our members, everyone watching, if they want to get in touch with you, if they want to learn more about Zeus, mm -hmm. where do they go, how do they get a hold of you guys? It's pretty easy. Uh, we are very accessible. We are at uh, askzeus.com, like ask a question, and Zeus, like the Greek god, Z-E-U-S. So askzeus.com or 713-ASK-ZEUS or 1-800-ASK-ZEUS. It's, we're pretty easy to be found. We're, we are, we, we are, our platforms are, are easy to, to locate. Uh, and we're always running promotions or new deals or new programs, always. We're always innovating new things in our industry. We're noted for that. We, even if you checked our site one month, we recommend you check it a couple of months from now to see what new, uh, new ideas uh, Kathy's um, uh, created uh, to put on the platform and, uh, and what new programs or incentives that we're offering. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Great. All right, well thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we hope you got a little bit of information that you can put into your investing career. Um, continue to post your comments. We'll make sure to get those answered by Steven. And the video will be here on our Facebook page uh, for you to come back and reference. And we will be sending a blog post on Friday with time stamped some, some more topics for you to, um, that you might be more interested in. Thanks so much. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.